over to Gary Young. I know lots of people have come to hear. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. I, not long, came back from the States. And while I was there, I was in Iowa, and I went to some Donald Trump rallies. <laughs> and uh, when people kind of say that my job is really, like, lucky you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I say, well, I do these things so that you won't have to. <laughs> I got some, some badges. I, there was Trump for President 2016. There was also this one, which I quite like, We Shall Overcome. Oh, uh, Donald, uh, Donald Trump. But they were a mixture of things that I thought um, either made me laugh or that made me aware that this was no laughing matter. This way it could be president. Um, and he's ridiculous. Um, when you stand in line, they sell hats that say, Make America Great Again. They're made in China. <laughs> um, and then there are other badges. Bomb the shit out of ISIS is, is one. Which is actually pretty much a direct quote from Donald Trump. And so if you're looking for you know, his foreign policy, as much as one would exist, that would be it. And, I mean, they're very intriguing events. And Because uh, I want to talk about, first of all, what is very American about Donald Trump. Because some of it is very American. And people like to use that in order to dismiss him and say, oh my God, those Americans. And that would be a mistake. But it is right, you know, so he comes out, it's incredibly camp. He comes out... Um, usually from behind a, a curtain and just <laughs> does that. And he's, he's orange. And when, if, if he became president, he would be the second non-white president of America. <laughs> I thought he could, he, could, he could run under the banner, orange is the new black. <laughs> he, he is... And then he just talks. He bloviates. He just he's like the drunk uncle that you're trying to avoid of the party. You're gonna build a big wall. It's gonna be a beautiful big wall. You're gonna love my wall. And the Mexicans are gonna pay for it. And people cheer. And uh, the fact that there's a net outflow of Mexicans from America into Mexico. So the only thing this wall would do is keep people in. It becomes irrelevant that none of the actual factual things about what he's saying matter. That he is a performer. And so the question then becomes, why do people like this performance? And in some ways, you know, there's nothing really that new about Donald Trump. He's that part of the Republican Party that has always been there in American politics. Actually, it used to be part of the Democratic Party that would be leveraged come election day, whether it was a Willie Horton ads or um, Ronald Reagan talking about welfare queens. They used to have what's called a dog whistle. Here's a quote from Nixon, who told his chief of staff, you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. And the key is to devise a system that recognizes that while not appearing to him. Now that was the entire strategy of the Republican Party since the Civil War era. And so they had these, what they called dog whistles, these ways of talking about race and evoking racism without actually crossing the line. And so what you have by this stage with Donald Trump is that they just got rid of the dog whistle. They've just got a straight up whistle. And he can say whatever he likes. He can say Muslims will no longer be allowed in the country. He can say um, uh, Mexicans are rapists. He can insult anybody and everybody, and he does. The disabled, uh, women, uh, the Chinese. I mean, there's almost nobody left for him uh, not to insult. And when you speak to his supporters, and this was great heart to be taken uh, from what I'm about to say and great worry because his supporters you expect I, I sent some selfies the first one I went to I sent some selfies of me like you know with the Trump people and I I sent some pictures of the badges you know bomb the shit out of ISIS and 
people were coming back on my Facebook page. I put them on my Facebook page, and they were saying, you know, be careful, and you know, just just watch yourself. And what they couldn't see, what they couldn't realise, was how ordinary the people were. That somehow there's this expectation that if you went back to the 30s, to Nazi Germany, that people would be goose stepping all around the place, and it would be somehow obvious, and it wouldn't have been. That they would have been very ordinary people who bought a lie. And who bought a lie because for some reason it was easier than the truth for them. So they thought. And so these are very ordinary people. And the heartening thing about that is that it's the same ordinary people, not extraordinary people. It doesn't mean you don't have to be Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. You don't have to be the kind of people that we've necessarily heard of. Can actually turn this back. That it doesn't take, it's about good people no longer remaining silent. It's about each person standing up where they are, on the bus, in your workplace, at the school gate, wherever it is, and facing the hate down that that's what does it. So these very um, uh, ordinary people who feel themselves in a tight spot and don't know what to do. America is in this place at the moment. There's been, in a way, nothing much has changed. Donald Trump is really leveraging the same kind of racism that Nixon leveraged and Reagan and George Bush Jr. and Sr. Black Lives Matter is galvanizing African Americans to protest state violence against black communities. But it's not that black, more black people are being killed. It's that America is now taking notice that it's a distinction, they say, when you're in journalism school, there's a difference between man, man bites dog, that's a story. Dog bites man, that's not a story. That happens all the time. But sooner or later, journalists have to ask themselves, well, why do these dogs keep buying people? Who owns these dogs and why do they keep buying the same people? And that's really what's happened in America, that suddenly the media class, the political class, have been forced to reckon with the daily reality of what it's like to be an African-American, uh, uh, an African-American person, particularly an African-American youth, which is that you live in a state of terror. You live believing that you might be killed. I've just finished a book which is about all of the kids. It doesn't come out until November. You're not allowed. They don't like bringing out books during the election year because nobody talks any sense during the election year, so there's nothing that you can do with the book. You actually have to wait for the election to go before you can have a political conversation, which um, says something about the election to it. Um, so it's coming out in November. It's about all, it's called A Day in the Death of America. It's about all of the kids and teens who were shot dead in one day in America. Every day, seven kids are shot dead in America. I picked a day at random. There were ten kids who were shot dead uh, on that day. And uh, there were seven, seven were black, two Latino, one white. And every single black parent, when I asked them, did you think that this could happen to your son? They were all boys. To a person, they looked at me like I was kind of, and they said, of, of course, yeah, of course. One of the mothers said, well, I didn't think it would be him. I thought it would be his older brother. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, working class African Americans are trying to get their kids to 18 without being in prison or dead. And that's uh, the notion of what successful parenting is, given the confines that you're living in. And Black Lives Matter has drawn attention to that. But it's not that that reality has changed. On the other hand, you have Trump um, uh, doing what he's doing. And that's what's really very American about it. But here's what's not very American about it. It's that Trump is appealing to a section of the white working class who have seen their wages stagnate for a generation, who are struggling with job insecurity, uh, whose um, um, life expectancy is falling. Working class white Americans, their life expectancy um, is falling. They've just had almost a generation of wealth wiped out since 
the economic crash. And they're looking for someone to blame. <laughs> and if you understand Trump in that context, then he's not that different to Marine Le Pen, <laughs> the True Finns, Victor Orban, Skirt yeah. Wilders. Each one is particularly Dutch or Finnish or French in their own way, but each one is galvanizing a very, very similar uh, uh, constituency in a very <coughs> similar way. And the root of these concerns, I think, is the neoliberal system in which we live, which operates according to the golden rule. And that's that those who make the gold make the rules. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so in a system like that, where you can move, they keep worrying about people moving. I remember <coughs> I studied Russian, French and Russian, that's why I studied at university. And I remember before the war came down, they, one of the things they used to say that was so terrible about the Soviet Union, and I thought this was terrible about the Soviet Union, was that it didn't allow people to travel. That people could not of their own free will just, just leave. And then as soon as the wall came down, they put up another wall and they said, well, you can't come in here. I mean, obviously, we think it's a good thing that you're traveling, but you ain't traveling here. <laughs> well, politics kept them in and economics kept them out. I believe in the free movement of people. Yeah. And I find it morally, I don't find it absurd, I understand the reason behind it, but I find it m morally bankrupt that we live in a world where machines and money can move easier than people. That nobody's stopping a machine or money or any of the things, uh, you know, software, hardware, and saying, are you going to put somebody at work? Because if you're going to put somebody at work, you can't come in. But as soon as a human being shows up, then suddenly they are uh, being interrogated. Now, you know, I don't assume that open borders is anything that's going to happen soon. But I actually personally believe that it's a very important principle that human beings have the right to move around the world. This is our world. It's not money's world. It's not a world. Flags are something that we invented. We invented flags. We invented countries. But we are people. We drew these boundaries. We made these laws. We can unmake them. So, when you live in this world where, at the press of a button, you can move your capital to somewhere where labour is cheaper and unions are weaker and regulations are slacker, then people move too. You actually don't leave them with an awful lot of choice. Also, if you are polluting the world in the way that we are, then people have to move because you're destroying their environment. And finally, and kind of most obviously when we have a speaker from Mosul here, and we're talking about Syrian refugees and so on, if you were going to bomb huge parts of the world and force people to move because they cannot live, then what right do you have to say that you can't come here? They're coming here. To a large extent, this refugee crisis, I believe that everybody should be able to move wherever they want, wherever they want, whenever they want. But actually, large numbers of these people would not have wanted to move if they could have stayed. And they are actually refugees from our politics, our war, our pollution. And so this is very much a problem that we have made. So when, when there is this sense of kind of like, well, you know, we can't, we can't take in all the world's misery. We'll stop creating the misery. And then you won't have to understand it as taking in um, the world's misery. But I think if we start from an understanding of neoliberal globalization, and particularly what's happened over the past eight years, then it becomes possible to reframe the discussion because an awful lot of what is at the root of these concerns 
concerns that fuel and um, nurture racism are legitimate concerns. Not all of them, but a lot of them. That for some people, the fact that we live in a more cosmopolitan world and that means we can get lots of different kinds of cheese and different kinds of you know, coffee and, and uh, might be fantastic. But for other people, they're scared. They're scared about their livelihoods. And they see a whole lot of stuff happening that they don't understand, that they have no control over, and they look for someone to blame. Now, neoliberal globalization is a force without a face, it's a system without a center, and so unless there is an argument, a counter-argument, then the notion, look, gypsies, <laughs> the Roma, Muslims, refugees, Syrians, the enemy of the month club, unless we come up with a counter-argument, then those are much more easily identifiable targets than abstract conversations about the banking system. But I think we can say, look, these Syrian refugees, they did not close your library. Yeah. They didn't trade in credit default swaps. They are not the reason why we are in the situation that, that we are in. Actually, if we had been able to stop our government participating in that war, then maybe there wouldn't be the kind of ISIS that would be trashing Syria right now. Yeah. Now, this is as much as we And I think that's an argument that can be made, and I think it's an argument that can be won. I was heartened when I arrived back in August um, from the States, not long after um, Alan Kurdi, um, all of the publicity around Alan Kurdi. And I'd seen, when I was in the States, I think, Katie Hopkins talking about cockroaches. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and this to me, it was like Kafka's metamorphosis in reverse, that here you had the so-called insect turned back into a human being. So suddenly we were talking about a child. And it saddened me because I thought, Jesus, this is what it took. This is what it took. It took people to see a three, four-year-old child face down in the surf, dead for them to understand that these were people, for them to understand that nobody makes those journeys, rickety boats, across deserts, with bandits risking life, and then people don't make those journeys in order to pick up benefits in England. It's not like the benefit system is so great, and there's some <laughs> fantastic kind of, you know, um, Facebook page that's like, look, if you really want to, you know, if you really want to get 20 quid a week, this is what you have to do. <laughs> it's going to be golden, I promise you. But there was something that came out of that. And it was something that I didn't know existed. I hadn't been here. And that was this constituency that had effectively been orphaned of people supporting refugees, of this, just this outpouring that happened. Not the obviously hypocritical, opportunistic thing where the newspapers suddenly, you know, thought this was something they should worry about. But actually people saying, you know what, I'm gonna take my, I've gotta do something. I'm gonna take my van and I'm gonna take this stuff down to Calais. I'm, uh, I'm gonna collect all this stuff and I'm gonna take it over to this charity center. These were people I honestly, Obviously, I, you know, I'm a socialist, so I live in hope. It kills me. But I, I, um, so I knew that there were people who cared about refugees. Of course I did. But I didn't know it was such a big constituency. I didn't know it was so active. And in the absence of any political champion, which you didn't have at the time, this was before Jeremy was elected, and actually it really moved me that the first thing he did after he was elected was go to this demonstration. I was like, well, we've never seen that before. <laughs> and that was already, in a sense, I was like, I don't kind of care what happens now, actually. Like, I've seen enough. <laughs> like, this is a new kind of, this, th this is already new, and this is already good, because it is forcing a reckoning with what has not been said. It's forcing a reckoning um, with our silence. And so the, the way in which those um, people 
galvanise themselves and organise themselves and uh, made that possible uh, was very heartening to me because I thought, okay, so there is more, obviously there's always more going on than I know about, but I think we surprised each other because people, I think, more obviously than we had realised, had been shouting at the television alone or weeping alone or somehow suffering internally um, alone. And what it said to me was that we are better, all present company accepted. We are better than our politicians. And we are better than our politics. That the things that we see reflected in the media, the things that we think of as being our politics, doesn't always include us, but that doesn't mean that we are not involved in politics, that we're better than that. As a country, we are better than that. And as human beings, we are better than that. And that's why it's so important, come March the 19th, that we have huge crowds, because they matter. Because they give other people hope. They give refugees hope. They give the people making those journeys, Macedonia and Serbia, they give them hope. But we give each other hope too. That when we stand up to racism, we're also standing up for each other. Thank you.